Any text has elements of genre in that it repeats certain formal patterns, follows some general structural models, employs more or less familiar stylistic conventions, and explores recognizable themes or concerns. It may be prose, poetry, or drama, for instance, fiction or non-fiction, journalism, chronicle or manual, novel, novella, or short story, first person, third person, or framed narration, autobiographical, historical, or philosophical, tragic, sentimental, or comic, realistic, fantastic, or melodramatic, and so on and so forth, often in various combinations. Genre is one way in which we, as readers, categorize and distinguish between texts. But it is also a way in which texts set readers' expectations. Nowhere is this more true than with so-called genre fiction, such as much crime fiction, science fiction, fantasy, or romantic fiction, which tends to follow genre rules particularly closely, sometimes to the extent of being relatively predictable. A murder mystery, for example, will open with an unexplained death, but end with a resolution, as the detective almost always solves the case. A romance novel will begin with an unhappily single young woman, who over the course of the story will almost always find her Mr. Wright, only after several run-ins with superficially charming Mr. Wrongs. It is in part the predictability, but also the popularity of genre fiction, that means that it is sometimes disparaged, or seen as inferior to literary fiction. With money to burn, however, Argentine author Ricardo Piglia, renowned for what is often philosophically dense and experimental fiction, such as the novel Artificial Respiration, or the stories collected in Nombre Falso, as well as for his astute and innovative literary and cultural criticism, takes on genre fiction. This is a thriller, an account of a heist and its consequences, that draws particularly on the hard-boiled detective fiction of U.S. authors such as Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. As critic Gilles Selne puts it, Money to Burn is a thoroughly hard-boiled novel. It certainly shares Hammett and Chandler's cynicism, as for example in a book such as Hammett's Red Harvest, about police corruption and murky politics, that questions who the true criminals are. What is robbing a bank compared to founding one? As Piglia's epigraph, taken from German playwright Bertolt Brecht, has it. At the same time, Money to Burn also reworks or alludes to other genres, particularly as they have been developed by Argentine authors, such as the social realism of Roberto Alt, the metafictional trickery of Jorge Luis Borges, and the politically engaged journalism of Roberto Walsh. In other words, this is a novel that is very aware of its place in a series of literary traditions that range from pop culture and pulp fiction to high culture and even the avant-garde. The tale the novel tells is substantially a true story. It reconstructs events from September to November 1965, when an armed gang robbed a van taking over 7 million Argentine pesos of payroll money, equivalent to somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 US dollars at the time, in the region of 300,000 to 450,000 dollars now, from a bank to the town hall in a municipality on the outskirts of Buenos Aires killing the courier and a police officer in the process, 
and then the gang fled across the river plate to the Uruguayan capital of Montevideo. There they hid out for several weeks, until a pair of the gangsters were discovered putting false number plates on a car, leading to another shootout in which a Uruguayan officer was killed, after which the criminals escaped to a flat not far from the city centre. An informant, however, betrayed them, and led the authorities to this hideout, which was then surrounded by up to 350 armed police, practically the entirety of Montevideo's police force. With the Argentines refusing to surrender, a siege ensued that lasted over 15 hours throughout the night of November the 5th and on into the following afternoon, in front of a crowd of curious onlookers who made their way to the street outside. Hundreds of rounds were exchanged on both sides, as well as flamethrowers and Molotov cocktails, causing very significant damage to the building. Two policemen died in what soon became known as the Battle of Liberay, after the besieged building as did two of the three gang members, with the third, seriously wounded, dying a little later. Though there is some confusion as to which of the three survived, and for how long, as with some of the other facts detailed here. The case clearly fascinated Piglia, who wrote about it almost immediately in his diary, where he also records, through much of 1966 and 1967, his plans to turn it into a novel, which he starts writing by the second half of 1967, weighing up various possible titles, such as El Robo, The Robbery, and Entre Hombres, Among Men. As critic Daniel Balderston notes, the diaries reveal that even almost five years after the events that inspired it, in June 1970, he is still working on the novel. But it gets put aside, and Piglia only returns to the project in the 1990s, for it finally to be published in 1997. Somewhere along the line, however, things change. Not everything is as it seems, and the story as it emerges has undergone significant modifications. More importantly, it has also become, amongst other things, a reflection on the relationship between fiction and reality, and on the ways in which fictions sustain our sense of what is real and true. And in the Battle of Liberay, at least as Pelia portrays it, what is at stake and is briefly but shockingly betrayed, is our collective belief in that most fictitious of things, money. In the epilogue to Money to Burn, Piglia, or his narratorial surrogate, declares that this novel tells a true story, and he goes to some pains to outline the procedures he has followed to eliminate all traces of fiction or unresolvable speculation. I have always used original material in the accounts of the words and actions of its characters. Whenever I have been unable to confirm the facts with direct sources, I have opted to omit that particular version. He details the sources on which he is drawn contemporaneous newspaper coverage, transcripts of interrogations, witness statements, psychiatric reports, and even the secret recordings made by the police department of what went on in the besieged flat. He tells us of the people who have helped him with his research, judges who allowed him to consult this mass of material, a lawyer who gave him access to records of the interrogations, and a friend, who lived in Montevideo at the time, who helped him orchestrate the different versions of this same story from a variety of descriptions 
and evidence. Pelia also recounts a chance encounter on a train headed to Bolivia with one of the story's protagonists, Blanca Galeano, who had a brief relationship in Uruguay with one of the dead gunmen. He tells us he took notes of his lengthy conversations spanning two days with this first-hand witness. For in those days, I still considered that a writer had to go everywhere with his journalist notepad. Finally, he says something about the process of writing the book, and how when he returned to it, over a long lapse, and worked on his initial drafts, he gave that first version a complete overhaul, in order to be absolutely faithful to the facts. And indeed, in the body of the book itself, Piglia frequently includes parenthetical asides to indicate the sources of his information, or at least that he has sources. According to the daily papers, according to the report by Dr. Bunge, according to sources, and even the limits of what they can tell him, this remained unconfirmed. If the book's genre is true crime, Piglia emphasizes its truth. As scholar David Conlon observes, to frame the book as a journalistic enterprise, retelling events from a new perspective, also places it within the tradition established by Argentine campaigning journalist Rodolfo Walsh. Indeed, Conlon argues that Money to Burn constitutes a specific homage to texts by Walsh, such as Operation Massacre, which investigates the state's extrajudicial detention and killing of a group of working-class men suspected of involvement in an attempted insurgency in 1956, and above all, Quien Mato a Rosendo, which is about the assassination of a labor union leader. Like Walsh, Piglia dramatizes a historical crime, giving face and personality to victims of violence in what Conlon calls, pointing out also similarities with the mousetrap scene in Shakespeare's Hamlet, an attempt to reframe and thereby seize authorial control from a corrupted state in respect of the narrative of a crime. Walsh's work is often said to be an origin for the specifically Latin American genre of the testimonio, which aims to give voice to those, the working class, women, indigenous people, and so on, who traditionally have not had access to self-representation through writing. And in readings of both Walsh's books and subsequent testimonials, the veracity and reliability of subaltern representation is crucial for the political effect that they seek. It is because their revised versions of what happened are true that the reader is invited to solidarity with the protagonists of the histories they recount. In Piglia, however, though we are perhaps invited to empathize with the anti-heroes of his narrative, it is less clear that our solidarity is incited. We are not asked to seek justice for the dead gunman, in part because the very idea of justice is under interrogation. Moreover, in Piglia, it is less clear that truth is at stake in quite the same way. It does not take great analytic acuity to realize that, for all his assurances, Piglia often plays somewhat fast and loose with the truth in Money to Burn. This becomes apparent when he provides, for instance, accounts of conversations and even characters' internal thoughts that 
no amount of research could substantiate. Or, for instance, when he seems to claim a gunman who died in the siege as one of his sources, recalled and recounted the kid. In this, however, it is not very different from non-fiction novels such as Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, which similarly deals with a murder case and, likewise, invents or changes details. But readers familiar with Pelia's other work will also be tipped off by the appearance, as a young reporter, of one Emilio Renzi, who frequently figures in Pelia's fiction as an alter ego of the author himself, whose full name was Ricardo Emilia Piglia Renzi. The novel even toys with us a little when it reveals the name, found on the press pass on the lapel of his corduroy jacket, which clearly read Emilio Renzi or Rienzi. Then, in the epilogue, the name is coyly reduced to the initials E.R. to describe the person who allegedly covered the assault and served as the Argentine paper El Mundo's special reporter on the spot. The sense of a game suggested by the disclosure and subsequent retraction of literary hints, hints of literariness amid claims to truth, indicates a debt to the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges, famous precisely for such knowing falsifications. Indeed, for critic Herbert Brandt, in Platica Mara, Piglia picks up where Borges leaves off and takes literary falsification to a new level. We may start to become suspicious about what other elements of this true story may turn out to be fabrications. In fact, the publication of Money to Burn led to not one, but two lawsuits against Pelia from survivors or relatives of survivors of the events he depicts. Ironically, one was on the basis that he told the truth too openly. Blanca Galliano argued that she had tried to keep quiet about her involvement in the events, and that the book had broken that silence. The other lawsuit, brought by Claudia Dorda, daughter of one of the gunmen, who in the book is called the Gaucho Dorda, alleged by contrast that it made up details about her father, specifically by portraying him as homosexual and addicted to drugs. Both suits failed. The first, on the basis that the facts of the case were well known. The second, on the basis that this was a work of fiction. Uruguayan journalist Leonardo Habacón has investigated the events himself and written a book about the true history of the burnt money case. Among other discrepancies, Habakorn claims that nothing that the book says about the four principal gangsters is true. Piglia entirely invents their backstories and key characteristics. Dorda was indeed not homosexual, for instance. And perhaps most strikingly, given that it is this element that gives the book its eventual title, the gunman did not burn the stolen money during the siege and throw the lit bills out of the flat windows and onto the street below. Habakorn is quite definite. The money was not burnt. Other reports are less certain, although all agree that the money was never recovered. At best, Piglia elaborates this central strand of his novel around a rumoured possibility. This is fiction, after all. Does it matter that Pelia takes such liberties with the truth? Why would he change the story? 
And what difference do his changes make? Do we feel cheated or betrayed in some way to discover how much is invention? Pause the video and write down some ideas. While you do that, I'll have a glass of medio y medio, but I'll be right back. Obviously, our attention is drawn to the elements that Pelia changes in the story. The fact, for instance, that he's invented a homosexual relationship between the gangsters Gaucho Dorda and Kid Bignone is a further sign of its significance, though no doubt it is significant enough in the novel already. It is a moment of deep pathos when Dorda holds Bignone in his arms, embracing him half-naked as the kid was dying. The blonde gaucho wiped his face and tried not to cry. Then the kid raised himself up ever so slightly, leaning on one elbow, and murmured something into his ear which no one could hear. A few words of love, no doubt, uttered under his breath, or perhaps left unuttered, but sensed by the gaucho, who kissed the kid as he departed. This is an image of tenderness amid the carnage, a moment of humanization that escapes the official record, just as whatever words may pass between the two gangsters are lost, even to the novelist's imagination. However much he goes beyond what we can ever know about what may have happened in the inferno of the shootout, Pelia signals a limit, even to the powers of fiction, to fill in the gaps. If art does not necessarily imitate life too closely in Money to Burn, the book provides plenty of examples of life imitating art. It is notable that for all their depiction as semi-educated hoodlums, the gangsters are also readers. The kid Bignone tells us that he took up reading in prison. It is here that not only is he turned into a rent boy, a drug addict, I became a real thief, a peronist and a card sharp. I learned to fight dirty, how to use a headbutt to split the nose of anyone who tried to split your soul from your body. He also read every history book in the library. I didn't know what else to do with myself. You can ask me who won which battle in whatever year you choose, and I'll tell you, because in jail you have fuck all to do, and so you read. Similarly, the group's leader, Maliton, like every true gangster, is an avid reader of the crime pages of the daily papers. He reads with a savage pleasure in part to see himself and his exploits featured. In reading about what he himself had done, he felt both satisfied at not having been recognized, and at the same time saddened at not seeing his own photo, while secretly preening himself at this dissemination of its disgrace, being anxiously devoured by thousands upon thousands of readers. But reading is also one of his weaknesses, because the primitive sensationalism that cruelly resurfaced in the face of each new crime made him think that his brain was not all that strange when compared with those degenerate sadists who gloat over horrors and catastrophes. Identifying as a reader, and with readers' vicariously sadistic desire to revel in violence and destruction, surely a desire that we ourselves share at least a little, if we are drawn to a thriller such as Money to Burn itself. He realizes that he is a particularly productive part of a literary and moral economy that thrives on the spectacle of criminality. 
If someone like Malito did not exist, he would have to be invented by someone like Pelia. Dorda is less of a reader, but is similarly impressionable in his consumption of culture. He is described as a translation machine for the way in which he mimics what he sees on the cinema screen. Dorda could get to see even a whole series of films and translated every one, as if he were on screen, as if he'd lived it all himself. Once we had to take him out of the screening, because he pulled out his willy and began weeing. In the film he could see a child urinating, his back to the audience, urinating in the night, in the middle of the countryside. In the Liberae, all the gunmen seem to think they are living out some kind of cinematic cliché. Surely they must have spent their lives watching war films and were now acting as if they thought they were a suicide commando unit, fighting behind opposing battle lines, in foreign territory, surprised in their flat by the Russians, the other side of the wall, in East Berlin. They are living out scripts that have already been written for them. Plots pre-established by genre films and genre fiction. Indeed, the feedback loop between reality and representation in the gunfight at the Liberae is particularly intense. Not only a journalist drawn to the scene of the siege, their microphones pressed to the wall, but so are the TV cameras, which begin a live broadcast, covering events as they unfold it. It even reached the gunmen, watching television in their room, watching the events of which they were themselves the protagonists. For the first time ever in history, we're told, it was, pos pos it was possible to transmit it all live, without censorship. Hence the crowd of curious onlookers, alerted to what is going on, who come down to the site of the action. And more generally, for hours the entire population of Montevideo was tuned in to the momentous events that were shaking the country. At the centre of this live spectacle, the gunmen are on stage, or rather on screen, actors in their own movie tragic protagonists of the Argentine version of a Greek tragedy, but also anti-heroes of a thriller for which they've been preparing and been prepared their entire lives. Here, however, the gangsters break the script. Literally, they burn their script, the stolen money that lies around them. Moreover, aware of the spectacle, of the audience entranced at their every move, they began tossing burning thousand peso bills out of the window. From the kitchen skylight they succeeded in floating the burning money down towards the corner. The bills looked like butterflies of light, flaming notes. In response, a buzz of indignation rippled through the crowd. This is not what they have come to see. Money is, after all, one of the most powerful fictions that structure social relations. It is, on the one hand, the fiction of value, that a small lump of metal or strip of printed paper has worth based on collective belief or a collective suspension of disbelief. Credit comes from the Latin credere, to believe, or to trust. But perhaps this is less belief than habit. In fact, the thieves show, it is very easy to burn the stuff. Their whole stash goes up in flames in only fifteen minutes. It is just that nobody thinks to do so. On the other hand, 
there is the fiction of universal equivalence. The notion that everything has its price. Anything can be reduced to numbers in exchange for any other thing via the medium of money. But the thieves' refusal to negotiate, their well-founded distrust of the police and the authorities, steeped in corruption, is also a denial that there can be any fair transactions, any agreement on rates of exchange. They have so much money that it is effectively worthless. Better a potlatch, as a Uruguayan philosopher is quoted as saying, an act absolute and free in itself, a gesture of sheer waste and sheer outpouring, a sacrifice made to the gods. Instead of money as trade, the gang trade freedom for money by asserting that they can get free of money itself. This sacrifice, however, is seen as sacrilegious. It's a sin, a peccato, as Dora himself notes. For the watching crowd, it is like something from a witch's Sabbath straight out of the Middle Ages, according to the papers. They couldn't bear the prospect of five hundred thousand dollars being burned before their very eyes, in a move that left the city and the country horror-struck. Later, Dorda, the last man standing in the burnt-out flat, looking back over his life, concludes that, nonetheless, he had ended well, whole, without betraying anyone. Yet he has, in fact, by betraying money, betrayed society en masse. As critic Joanna Page notes, one of the attractions of reading about crime and heists is that, for all that they may glamorize law-breaking, they also buttress some of the most widely held and ingrained beliefs about the principles that undergird our own law-abiding labor. Armed robbery is a crime that only confirms the value of money to a society organized around it. By torching the cash, for which they have already sacrificed so much, by contrast, the criminals effectively attack the very fabric of society. The gunmen repeatedly mock the futility of wage labor. Dorda, on the point of burning a thousand peso note with a Ronson lighter, comments that a bank clerk would have to work at least a month to get a bill of this size as he whiles away his life counting other people's money. Now he and his accomplices are, in a flash of flame, prepared to break the illusion that anchors such monotonous subservience. Devoted to their servitude, however, the onlooking Uruguayans are shocked and angry. In the end, fiction wins the day. The people take their revenge on Dorda, as he is subjected to a hail of blows from every side, kicks, punches, spitting, insults, every kind of vulgarity and brutality. All to uphold the moral law and the power of money. Then, as the ambulances and police cars depart, the street is, at last, empty once more. The epilogue ends similarly with escape and disappearance, as the narrator describes himself standing on the empty station platform, watching the train carrying Blanca Galliano recede into the distance. Peace is restored. Yet there is something sufficiently disturbing about the story he has heard, that Piglia will muse over it for another thirty years seeking the right form in which it can be told once again.